Mark, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you are all having the experience that I'm having, which is that even though this uh, morning to night conference schedule is completely exhausting, it is simultaneously energizing to spend all this time with such talented and committed colleagues uh, all talking about things that we care about so deeply. Uh, today's topic is one that I spoke to yesterday at the opening session, and I'll be brief today, but I wanted to say that it means a lot to me in part because, like so many of you, I've seen the power of forward motion when it comes to diversity and inclusion uh, at uh, my own opera company. In 2011, when Joe Fowler uh, joined our staff as Director of Marketing and Public Relations, uh, he came from the Alliance Theater in Atlanta, where the audience is more diverse than the audience we had for opera in St. Louis. I remember Joe looking at the house and saying to me one night, we need to work on this. And I said, oh, yes, we are working on it. Uh, to which Joe asked, how? Uh, and I talked about uh, diversity in casting and uh, the upcoming world premiere that we had scheduled by a multi-Grammy award-winning composer who is African-American. And I gave my usual platitudes about opera being the sound of our common humanity across our differences. Um, Joe introduced me to a book that uh, many of you also probably know. And if you don't, uh, I encourage you to get it. It's by Donna Walker Kuhn, uh, former marketing director for the Public Theater in New York, a book called Invitation to the Party. It's, a, uh, it's full of practical advice about uh, building audiences that reflect the diversity of a whole community. And its premise is that this cannot be a project of the marketing department or education department, but rather a whole institution sustained commitment with leadership from the top. At Opera Theater, we decided to make that commitment, and I hasten to point out that we do not claim to be doing this any better than anyone else, nor do we have any magic bullets to offer, but we have experienced consistent forward motion, which included last season double-digit uh, increases in non-white audiences, building on an upward trend in those numbers over the last seven years. We put this commitment in our mission statement uh, and our core values, and one of the most effective steps we took uh, was the creation of an engagement and inclusion task force, a group of about 20 people, board, staff, uh, and an amazing group of leaders who volunteer their time from the African American, Latino, Asian, and LGBT communities. Uh, this group has been working since 2012, uh, meeting three to four times a year, offering advice, serving as a think tank, volunteering to activate their own networks to support, to, excuse me, to support our events and performances, and most of all, offering us a space to have some very real conversations about what an arts organization can do in our community uh, to help with the painful histories of division and discrimination. This is, there's more to say about that, but I'll leave it there uh, and mention another quick story about recent focus groups that we conducted with uh, diverse millennial and Gen X audiences. A comment that we heard repeatedly from participants who had attended one or two of our operas but were otherwise new to opera was that they were pleasantly surprised to see diversity on the stage and in the audience uh, and that this uh, diversity signaled to them that opera was not the ancient moribund art form of stereotype uh, but uh, rather something that felt contemporary and of our own times. And by the way, this observation came mostly from the white younger audiences uh, who were speaking in the focus groups. And this observation crystallized in my mind the idea that diversity in casting is something that we do not simply because it is right, but also because it makes better art, uh, art that resonates with today's audience. In closing, I think it's important to acknowledge the elephant in our room, which is, uh, I don't have to tell you, that our opera companies are still overwhelmingly led by white men in the top artistic and administrative positions. I actually used to wonder if I could get hired to run an American opera company, since even though I am a white man, I don't have an English accent. <laughs> <laughs> The opera world is not alone in this situation of undiverse leadership, staffs, and audiences, but suffice it to say, there is a lot we can and I believe must learn quickly from other disciplines uh, and industries who have made more progress. So for Opera America, I can say that this is a whole, institu whole institution commitment, and I'm grateful to the Opera America staff for all that they have already done, 
including assembling this tremendous group of presenters and responders from both outside the world of opera and from the ranks of our professional companies. Now back to Mark. Tim, thank you, thank you. Roberto Bedoya is a great friend of Opera America. Currently, Roberto is the cultural affairs manager at the city of Oakland. We have known him for many years. Some of you will have met him at our 2015 annual conference in Washington, D.C., where he was our keynote speaker. He was new to opera uh, at that time, leading up to the conference, and we made sure he saw some performances, and I think we've actually created an opera fan out of Roberto. He is the lead faculty member partner with us in our civic action group, where we are looking at the ways that opera companies can increase their public value outside the walls of the opera house. He's an invaluable uh, resource, a great ally, and a dear friend. Roberto. Thank you, sir. My pleasure. Uh, Mark was a wonderful, um, he's a wonderful man. He's a really good thinker. I take, you know, I watch how he facilitates, and I'm always stealing from him. I'm modeling from him. So I'm going to be facilitating a little bit later. Let's see how well I do. Uh, but he asked me to talk a little bit about the framing behind today's uh, session. And mainly because I uh, think about belonging an awful lot. I think about the plural an awful lot. I think probably too much about a lot of different things. And I've been thinking about you know, this particular panel, uh, creating change equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I sat there with that phrase for a while, and I said, I, had, I was like kind of uncomfortable with it, mainly because equity, diversity, and inclusion reads as nouns. And I want to hear the story of equity, diversity, and inclusion as verbs. And so our panelists today are going to tell us about how they animate these words in their practices as leaders in the field. And then we'll have a discussion about that with some respondents. So that's it for me. A word about our format. We have four distinguished speakers. Each of them will speak to you for about eight minutes. I did not give them a word count the way I gave the, the people a word count in the opening session. They'll speak to you and I will introduce them. I will thank them. I may ask them a question or two just to help us make connections between their insight and our field. So we'll work on that. And then we're going to welcome to the stage four members, four people of our field. And Roberta will moderate a discussion as they react to what they've heard from our lead presenters and as they share with us their point of view around this material as uh, people of color, people from underrepresented populations in our field. Because again, we need to learn as white male cis leaders what is really going on in our field if we're to create change. So um, our first speaker is Carol McCord. Carol is someone uh, I've known for quite a while. She and I served on the board of the Performing Arts Alliance together. She has a history at the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, she has also just finished a stint as the Managing Director of Alternative Roots and is now the founder and CEO of the Equity Quotient, where she is a busy consultant dealing in these wonderful issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. She attended our strategy committee meeting in December and was a very, very important participant in that conversation. Please join me in welcoming Carol McCord. Thank you, Mark. Well, I have to say that I still find myself, um, as I did in New York in December at Opera America, going, what, what, <laughs> what am I doing here? Um, <laughs> I come from theater. Um, I've been in the arts more than 35 years. Um, I've been doing this work a long, long time. I've worked with large organizations, small organizations. I've been at this a long time. Um, and in my consulting work now, what I'm really trying to do is to help the arts field hone in on some of the most difficult issues we've ever had to deal with. 
Um, and what I've, and, and Mark has given me about eight minutes, so I don't have a lot of time for exposition, so I'm just going to kind of dive in. Um, I think that race and racism is one of the most critical issues of our generation, and I'm just putting it out there. That's what it is. That's what we're trying to deal with. Um, it's a complexicated issue. I love that word, where things are complex and complicated. Um, it makes people want to run for the hills. It's uncomfortable. We're grown up so we can do this work. We're smart, we're good people, we're interested, or you wouldn't be here, right? Equity, diversity, diversity and inclusion. What that says is that we acknowledge that there is inequity and that in our spaces we're not, we, that our spaces are exclusive. And diversity, on the other hand, is a result of inequitable practices and policies. It's a result of our exclusive spaces. Our country is incredibly diverse. It just doesn't reflect it in our field, and it's not just opera, dance, theater, museums, you name it. These are outcomes. They're results of policies, practice, and systems. Look around you in this space. This is the outcome of systems that go back almost 200 years. So I'm bringing you good news, I'm bringing you bad news, and I'm bringing you more good news. So the good news, no shame, no blame, and no guilt. I gave up guilt for Lynn about 25 years ago. I figured out it wasn't productive. <laughs> you know, it just wasn't productive. It's about action. And the only cure for guilt is to do better. So the good news. Um, I am absolutely certain. I may not know everything, but this I know for certain. There is not one person in this sit sitting in this room who invade, invented racism. Right? Not one. So this system was given to us, but we don't have to continue to pass it along. Future generations will thank us. The bad news, I'm also equally as certain that every single person in this room has been impacted, affected, and infected because it has been baked into our system from its inception. John F. Kennedy said that things don't just happen, things are made to happen. Ours is a race-based system. Yes? Fact. Race is not real. Not only is it not real, it was invented, roughly beginning about the 1700s, with many iterations along the way, until about the late 1920s. And throughout human history, until the creation of race, throughout human history until about the 1700s. Here's what we wanted to know. Who are your people? What's your name? Where are you from? What's your faith? What do you do? We may fight and kill each other over those things, but race was the first time in human history that we were fighting and killing each other over physical characteristics that nobody had any control over. That's white supremacy. That's the system. Research will tell you that you'll come across some names, Buffon, Meisner's, Blumenbach, scientists, naturalists, anthropologists, who created racial, racial classifications. Caucasoid, mongoloid, Australoid, negroid. They took all of humanity and put them into four separate groups. Really? Imagine that. <laughs> Caucasians, Asians, Australians, and negroid. Mongoloid and negroid. Negro, Spanish, for color, for the color black. And the only group that's not tied to land. If they were consistent, they would have said Africoid, yes? The only group tied to land. The people once known as Caucasians became, as Europeans became Caucasians, then white. And white, whiteness is fluid, Irish, Italian Jews didn't become white until the late 1800s for the Irish, turn of the century for Italians, and about mid 20th century for Jewish people. So it's very fluid. What does this mean for us today? Well, whiteness is another word for power. How else do you build and enforce an ideology that was created to acquire, accumulate, accumulate consolidate, and protect wealth? Because that's what it was all that vast land out there. You had to have people to farm it. 
So I frame this struggle as a human rights struggle. I, this is a human rights issue. It goes back to the doctrines of discovery and look them up. It's important because what the doctrines of discovery said to the Columbus and the guys when they were out exploring, if you come to lands where there are no Christians there, they are not human. They are not human. The land is unoccupied. You can take the land and everything in it or on it for the church and the Spanish crown. Yes. And the last time the doctrines of discovery was used to take indigenous land in the United States was 2005 because they've never been repealed or repudiated. That's why this is a struggle for human rights. This is not just a struggle or an issue about race and racism. It really is about how do we become more human human beings? How do we fully see each other as human beings until we understand that we are what? Human. And add our system as we have it right and as it's been given to us, the way that it was based, white supremacy says that only white people, only white Christians were fully human. That's the challenge that we have, and we can overcome this. Octavia Butler, one of the first black science fiction writers, said, everything you touch, you change. This is one of my favorite books, Parable of the Talents. Everything you touch, you change, and everything you change, changes you. An ideology that denies anyone's humanity denies one's own. Adrian Marie Brown says, the science, the social justice work is like science fiction. We're trying to create a world that doesn't yet exist. I'm inviting you to become science fictionists with us because this is something John F. Kennedy said, things don't just happen, things are made to happen. How do we make change? I think that you can start in the opera world within your companies. That's where you have the greatest opportunity for change. It doesn't require a grant. It doesn't require any money. It just requires intention, attention, and a willingness and a commitment to change. Um, thanks for listening and for not heading for the hills. <laughs> Carol, stay with, stay with me up here for a second. Thank you. So I, I, I have two questions for Carol. First one is, you are not of the opera world. You're from the theater world and, and an expert in other art forms. What does the opera world look like to you from outside? Um, and I've tried, I've gone three times um, um, to, an opera, to an opera, and I have to tell you that I've never felt more um, un uncomfortable um, because I just, I didn't see anyone in those spaces that really looked like me. Um, the last one was Toni Morrison's, and I think it was in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. um, Toni Morrison's Beloved, um, right. and I, a, a group of friends got together to see it, and I didn't make it through intermission. Because you felt uncomfortable. I felt so uncomfortable. Um, and I, I was director of theater programs at the National Endowment for the Arts. I was the first black person to head uh, a program at, at the agency, I mean, in the theater program. Um, I'm used to working in white spaces. Um, that the field is predominantly white. But there was, I, you know, we walked, going into that space, I have to tell you, people were looking at us <laughs> like, what are you doing here? And this was a piece about Toni Morrison. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mm -hmm. love it. Um, so yeah, and, and over the years, I looked at you know, I I just this is this one has been the hardest nut to crack for me. And when I say that in terms of that's why it feels weird to be here, because I I my sense if you ask people in my field and who look like me, where opera is in our lives, we would tell you it doesn't exist that we're not there in those spaces. If there is an avenue of intervention, and this is an artificial, narrow question, if there's a point of intervention that you feel an opera company should attend to first, what is that m place of intervention? Change the culture. It's a, it, and by that I mean, um, and I just had this conversation with, with uh, some people who work in the museums. When Mandela came to the United States after he was released from Robbins Island, he went to the White House and he began at the kitchen. 
He went to the kitchen and he met everybody in the kitchen staff and in the cleaning <laughs> staff, and he knew them by name before he went upstairs. And I ask, do you know the name of the security guards who guard your places? Do you know their names? Do you know their families? Is it a place where people are feel at, at, at the, the people who work there have to, that's the, if that's the cultural shift, when people from top to bottom feel like they have an investment in that, in that entity, in that organization, that they are trusted, that they are valued, um, that would be a huge shift. That's where I would start. A lesson for all of us. Carol, thank you very much. <laughs> Let me help you there. Thank you. Our next guest is Zanetta S. Drew. Zanetta is the executive director of the Dallas Black Dance Theater. She, this is the second time we've heard from the Dallas Black Dance Theater. She's been with the company for 30 years this year, so real institutional continuity. Thank you for giving up some of your Saturday. May I invite you to the stage, Zanetta Drew. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to Dallas. All of us are aware that our nation is and has been experiencing a legitimacy divide in many segments of society, including our religious, economic, racial, and our political structures for many years. The arts are not exempted from this divide, nor from its impact. There is a growing awareness that diversity, equity, and inclusion no longer can be just mere consideration, but now is a reality of absolute necessity for all of us to survive. Despite the number of minority-focused ventures that have developed over the years, it is still whites who primarily decide what will be produced and what will receive mainstream exposure. To be truly successful and considered validated, you must be justified and legitimized in your existence. Therefore, art and cultural endeavors that originate from an art form that people do not understand or recognize ultimately don't receive the art world's mafia seal of approval and that is to become known as sanctioned as high art. The demographics of social, ethnic, and generational changes of the 21st century demand that we in the arts change how we do our business, not just for our collective cultures, but also for the survival of our individual institutions. The widespread impact that results from the historical and societal differences of this legitimacy divide has impact on funding equity, audience development, institutional growth for minority arts organizations, individual artists, and non-traditional art forms. It creates a set of disparate performance expectations and creates competition with mainstream organizations. Some of the expectations of comparability with mainstream groups are for minority groups to be expected to perform against the same quantitative and qualitative measures, be able to create equal appreciation and appetite for your work in order to be relevant, and you must engage audiences and produce outcomes by conforming to the same methods resources, and behavior models. What is missing or absent from this conversation? It is the lack of understanding regarding the origin, development, and societal changes that have historically limited some and benefited others. So let's have that conversation today. What do we know to be some of the impacts of this legitimacy divide for the arts that we don't talk about. 
how about separate but unequal is really okay. Minorities and non-traditional art are optional and not essential to the vitality of the arts ecology in my city. Partnerships, collaborations, and audiences are to be created for the primary benefit of mainstream organizations and not vice versa. Excellence is never the automatic performance expectation and there is a penalty if you outperform your mainstream counterpart. Whether you're an artist, board member, organization, audiences, or even a donor. Example, a minority group received a million dollar interest-free bridge loan for its capital campaign from a funding agency. The group paid the loan back in full before it was due. The funder said it had never had a loan of this type repaid. Since they did not expect to get the payment, they booked it as a grant. When the minority group returned several years later, the funder advised that their board had never expected to get that money back, and so they considered it a grant and couldn't consider any additional funding. At the same time, other mainstream groups who were operating a deficit consistently were getting half million dollar grants yearly from the same organization. Sorry, you exceeded our expectations. Result, penalty for overperforming. Another question to explore. What types of actions, both conscious and unconscious, marginalize the forces of equity? In other words, where are our blind spots? Even though racial attitudes have evolved during the last half century, America has not entered a post-racial society, and many persons who respond positively to the pressures of political correctness are still unaware of how their attitudes and ethnic preferences have delegitimizing consequences for others. Example, an African-American dance company performed a groundbreaking work last year to disco music and themes. And the critics' review stated, the dancers look like prancing fillies. This is reminiscent of discussions where sportcasters used animals for descriptions of black athletes. How do you build audiences, seek additional funding support from anyone who doesn't already know you, or even uplift the artist? This word picture was an unconscious bias that marginalized the work and perceptions of legitimacy. Question for us here today. How many in this room believe the critic would have ever used this description in their review of the Rockettes? For our third impact, let's consider the difference between diversity and inclusion. What does welcome really mean? Guess who's coming to dinner? <laughs> a diversity invite. Picture this. You're invited as a guest, not ask your preference for meal, seated at the far end of the table with other diversity guests, unaware that a special reception had been held prior to the dinner, and that is what everyone is talk talking about. You're only invited to participate in the conversation for polite comment. The host makes a public statement to let everyone know that you've been sponsored and that you have not paid full fare for your meal. Yet, when dinner is over, you are asked to come be in the photo, front and center. This type of invitation ultimately becomes an image proposition for the host. However, picture this, an inclusive invitation. You are invited to dinner and ask your food preferences in planning the meal, seated in the midst of all other guests, invited to share fully in the dinner conversation, and ask how you would like to provide value for your meal at some equitable level. When asked to join in for the photo, 
the placement is natural and there is an ambience of respect and authenticity. This type of invitation ultimately becomes a value proposition for both the host and the guest. Example, in 2016, the Dallas Opera partnered with Dallas Black Dance Theater in its production of Showboat. And the experience was the most rewarding collaboration that we have done. It began with a salon discussion, involved board engagement, marketing exchange, equitable financial compensation, inclusion in free concert educational materials and talks, and a post-event cast party for 200 persons hosted at our facility. This was indeed a first. So what do all of us need to do to dismantle barriers that perpetuate, marginalize, and delegitimize sectors of our arts? First, we need to recognize that we all have blind spots and biases in today's society. Rather than project our own intentions for behavior on others, we need to talk hear and incorporate the ideas of others who represent different backgrounds and cultures. Our goal must be to create organizations, boards, staff, and yes, audiences that build trust, respect, and mutual support. And to do this, one must be willing to relinquish the power of personal preference and be vulnerable, open-minded, willing to learn from others and exhibit humility and patience, traits that have been asked of minorities and non-traditional groups for years. Finally, we must recognize that building bridges is not a join-up event or a join-up process, but a focused commitment to attaining a positive result regardless of the long journey ahead. Art is a wonderful, subjective, personal thing that can only be defined by the person engaging in it. Yet, our opinions do matter as a society. Society was wrong about Van Gogh's work during his lifetime. The quality of his paintings did not change. The materials didn't become more expensive. The subject matter is no different. Only one thing changed, and that it is our opinion of his work. Ladies and gentlemen, we in the arts must bridge this legitimacy divide because America has created the most wonderful tapestry of people on earth, and we collectively should be able to create the most wonderful tapestry of arts and culture that civilization has ever known. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have one question for you. Thank you. That was, that was just remarkable. Um, I'm glad you cited the Dallas Opera collaboration as a positive one. Now that project is over. What would you wish for continuity of relationship between your company and the Dallas Opera at this point? At this point, we're already talking about doing another collaboration and we have retained conversations uh, and had on, ongoing activities uh, with the opera. So it was not just a one shot. Are there, are there steps between projects? To, you know, did one great project, talking about another project. Are there other elements of relationship outside of projects that you would wish to see strengthened? Yes. I think that we all need to be able to enjoy the arts and programs of other groups. And I think that what we do is that we go and we visit when there's a production that we're collaborating with. But what we don't do is really get out and experience what is out there 
so that when it's time to collaborate, you have a background to work from. Mm -hmm. A context, and yes. as Roberta would say, showing up, the importance of showing up. Yes. Zanetta, thank you so very much. I really, really appreciate it. Fantastic, thank you. Let me help you then. I'm glad I'm not Kevin Moriarty. <laughs> Our next speaker, he is the artistic director of the Dallas Theater Center. We also heard from him the other day in our session with Dallas Arts Partners. He is the chairman of the Board of Theater Communications Group, a sister organization of Opera America. And I will say that TCG has done leadership work in this area of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And much of it has been spurred on, supported, and informed by Kevin's insight. So please join me in welcoming Kevin Moriarty. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I am the beneficiary of immense privilege. Throughout my entire life, I've had the opportunity to be mentored, to have doors open for me, to have moments of uh, indiscretion or youthful folly or, or professional mistakes or errors be thought of as opportunities for education and for growth and for me to continue to advance in my field as a theater director and as a theater leader and in the broader community. It's um, humbling in the extreme to look at the lives and experiences of others in our country and very specifically for theater artists in the field which I'm so lucky to be a part of and realize that those privileges aren't automatically extended to everyone. I'm the artistic director of a theater that's almost 60 years old. Uh, in, at TCG, we now have taken to accurately describing theaters like mine, the large theaters that make up the great regional theater movement around this country as historically white theaters, because that is actually what they are. And coming to grips with that, acknowledging that, owning that, has been a journey for me and continues to be a journey for the theater field. Not a quiet, uh, subconscious journey anymore, but now a journey that at TCG and throughout our theater community, we are increasingly encouraging to be a dialogue that we have out loud in the open, even when it's uncomfortable, even when, it, um, when those inequities can start to feel um, almost overwhelming to everyone in the conversation. Uh, those conversations are incredibly important. And as a theater field, though we have so far to go, and the idea that we would be a model is frankly heartbreaking. <laughs> and yet we have genuinely made some progress and as a field are committed to making more. Uh, as one of those people lucky enough to lead one of those big, large institutions, uh, here are a couple practical things that, um, that we've been doing at our theater under the inspiration of our broader field and the work we've done with the EDI Institute at TCG to start to rebalance some of those inequities. One thing we've done is we've started measuring everything. This is just the practical list of kind of stuff. We started measuring everything. We keep track of who's on our staff, who's on our board, uh, who, who are the artists on our stage, who's in our audience. And we then go back to those numbers and compare them against the community that we're fortunate enough to serve. And we then look at those numbers every year, we report them back, to each other, and we seek to make those numbers move toward an accurate reflection of our community. Last year, 52% of the artists on our stage were people of color. In a city that is a majority minority city, that is, getting, that is us getting closer, but still not at the numbers that we're striving for. We've made a series of in-house rules, and we use shorthand around them, like this. 
when in theater, the way designers are chosen, choreographers, music directors, is that typically a theater hires a director, then they typically engage the director in a conversation about who would you like to be your collaborators. And then the director often names Tony Award winning set designers and, and uh, internationally known uh, choreographers. And then you talk about, oh, we'd love to have them at our theater and you reach out to them for interest and availability. I, I, that's not necessarily the case with opera companies that the director or the, even the conductor is necessarily the lead on that. But in theater, there are those various voices. So we now have a rule. When we call a director and say, who, uh, who do you want to work with on your creative team? We say, before you answer that, just so you know, we have no all-white, all-male design teams at our theater. That is almost always the first time that any director has been told that. And uh, initially, there's a pause. And then they come back, and they name Tony Award winners. And they name internationally renowned artists who include people of color. And we move forward and make great art. It hasn't been that difficult to institute these rules but it has taken a conscious, and to be totally honest, uncomfortable conversation. And that has to come from me as the leader of the institution. It can't be the general manager or the, um, the uh, uh, yeah, finance folks or uh, even somebody else on my artistic staff. It has to be me that personally says that to those uh, leading artists at our theater. We had initial success with staff, because, with the artists, because it's something that in the power structure of theater, you, there are centralized control over who's in a play, who creates that play. So it's easier to disrupt those historic patterns of inequity. The staff was, has been much harder. We kept hearing, nobody applied. There's no one interested. Uh, we're hiring the best person for the job. So, we looked to the NFL and were inspired by the Rooney Rule, which requires uh, football teams to, to hire at the highest managerial levels. They have to interview uh, at least one person of color for those key leadership positions. So we instituted the Rooney Rule for every single full-time position at Dallas Theater Center. And we put that rule not only into place, but then added into the annual performance review of every employee at the theater center a category that says equity, diversity, inclusion. And your score on that, just like your score on balancing a budget or creating great art, directly impacts your salary increase. We do merit-based pay increase. So when you make a hiring rule, which is just you gotta interview somebody of color, you connect performance to values that the board many years ago declared was a central value, you start to see uh, progress now, uh, very significant progress. But to be honest, three years ago, at the on, as, as we were about to prepare to have that rule, we had multiple departments in the theater that had no full-time employees of color. All, the vast majority of people of color in our institution were in the artistic uh, department and in our education department. Now, uh, our general management office has five of seven employees who are people of color, including um, uh, our two key uh, financial uh, leaders. Uh, two members of our senior staff. It, it didn't take um, anything other than saying, you have to go out and make sure that the people in the room getting an opportunity to compete are actually reflective of the community. That's, been, that, that's required some new recruiting strategies. It's required looking at where do we post jobs. It's been some hard conversations with managers. I'm not gonna lie about that. But it is surprising how quickly it has begun to make a difference in our institution. Our board is perhaps even more complicated. And um, with our board, we had a burst of immense success, patted ourselves on the back, and then crashed and had immense failure. And we are in the midst of picking those pieces back up right now. With the board, we dedicated a full board retreat, a full day-long retreat with our board to issues of EDI. The board made a commitment to ensure that at least 50% of our incoming board class would be people of color. We met that commitment. Everybody celebrated. Uh, we dissolved our one-time EDI committee that had worked that year to ensure that goal. And everybody turned on to pressing issues of money, <laughs> which is what mostly in theater we uh, worry about. Uh, and then what happened is um, our numbers began to fall. And some of the folks who joined our board became disconnected and moved on. That was painful for us to realize that we had failed in that regard. And it took 
very difficult conversations with board leaders, then eventually with our full board, a re-engagement with the strategic plan, where our strategic plan has not just audience development and financial sustainability, but EDI right at the top of that plan, a commitment to uh, set metrics, to talk about it every single board meeting, to refocus board uh, uh, development committee, to focus on EDI, not just the ability of people to give. And that has uh, begun to make a real difference. In Dallas, we have a long way to go at the theater, throughout our arts community, and in our city. But if the folks like me, and frankly the folks who look like many of you in the positions of leadership that we have, don't take um, advantage of the uh, power and resources that we have access to, then change won't happen. And we can and must make a change. Thank you. Kevin, thank you, thank you. Um, you talk about diversity today, at least, um, numerically, about percentages on your staff or on stage and percentages in the community and the number of departments that now do have uh, people who are from underrepresented communities in the life of your company. I'd love to hear how this increased diversity has enriched your art and enriched your organization. Oh my goodness, that's, that's the best part. I mean, yeah, that, that's the easy part um, in every way. If you see, uh, we're, doing a, uh, we're doing a Sophocles Greek tragedy right now of Electra that's happening right outside the Opera House. It's an outdoor production, the audience moves around. It's, it's very innovative and half the cast are people of colors. If anybody has an opportunity to see that play, you would say, oh, these actors are phenomenal actors and the creative team, the designers are incredibly inventive, the, by expanding the folks in the room who make the art, our art has, has taken on dimensions that, um, that, I, that I couldn't have imagined. At the staff level, the change has been even more surprising, that when there's all white people talking about uh, how do we get a more equitable uh, representation of our community in the audience, it's, um, it's a pretty inauthentic uh, and problematic conversation. And when there's one person of color in a room where a whole bunch of, of white folks have power, the conversation is also different. I, ha I didn't know this in advance. I've, I've realized this over time as I've increasingly been blessed to be in rooms where uh, there's equal representation or even occasionally where I have the great fortune to be in the minority in the room. And suddenly the conversations in the room, and I'm not, I'm, I am talking about complicated things like conversations about race and diversity, but I'm also frankly talking about innovation in marketing or innovation in art. Uh, it, things that you wouldn't automatically assume the conversation would be different. But, um, but there's, um, when, when the space has um, the opportunity for all, everybody is enriched by it. That's fabulous, and I think it gets to what Roberto says about diversity not being a noun, but diversity being a verb. Absolutely. Thank you so much, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Our last guest this afternoon before we turn to our panel and bring Roberta back on the stage is L. Michelle Smith. Michelle leads citizenship and sustainability efforts for the AT&T Global Marketing Organization. Uh, she has been with AT&T and other boutique firms. She refers to herself as an entrepreneur, and we're just delighted that she's given up some of her Saturday to be with us here at Opera America. L. Michelle Smith. was 1987 and a 22-year-old producer decided to get the hottest rap group and a kind of a washed up rock group together and do something a little bit different. That rap group looked at him like he was crazy. The rock group kind of ignored him. But because the rap group had been sampling some of the 1975 hit Walk This Way, in their DJ sessions, they said, we'll give it a try. So what ended up happening was, let's see, do we have the slides up? Let's get the slides up. There we go, okay. What ends up happening is 
they put these two groups together and they created something totally different. It was something the music industry hadn't seen before. In fact, someone tried to put a name to it. They tried to call it hip rock or rock hip something. <laughs> but what ended up happening was taking rap mainstream. Suddenly you had that driving bass line and rhythm that was key to hip hop and that screaming guitar that was key to rock music. And you had something that was totally different. What Rick Rubin did that day was take a little bit of diversity and a little bit of culture and infuse it into mass market and create something totally different, which was innovative and disruptive. He set up the case for culture. I have a little girl, her name is Joni. In fact, she's sitting in the front row right now. She's four years old. She was born in 2012. One in every two babies born in 2012 is a baby of color. That means that Joni in her classroom is in the majority already. I like to take away the word minority because things are changing. You've seen the stat that in 2050, the minority will become the majority. Recent research has pushed that number to 2040. Things are changing. Let me tell you a little bit of the reason why. Not just because more people are coming to our country, but also because if you go back to the 2000 census, 17 years ago, the most checked box was the other box. We're all familiar with the African-American segment and the Asian segment and the Hispanic segment. And they have a buying power in the trillions, 1.4 for African-Americans, 1.4 in a couple of years for Hispanics. Asians right at a trillion, right underneath it, 854 billion. And guess what, LGBT at over 900 billion spending power. Let's overlay that with women. More than 50% 50, 50 of the population are women. The most intersectional group you could probably have has a decision-making purchase power. That means they spend other people's money too. <laughs> For $18 trillion. So do you want to leave that money? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so do you want to leave that money on the table? We have a real opportunity here, people. And I'm here to tell you that the new mass market is multicultural. Diversity drives pop culture. Nielsen has shown us in their consumer reports about African American and Latinos, but specifically African Americans, that 60, over 70% of white people and over 60% of Hispanics say African American culture drives pop culture. Now, we know this. <laughs> we see it on commercials all the time, whether it's hip hop or Motown, you hear the music in the background. It's something we know. But we saw something very similar in the Latino consumer report from Nielsen. The numbers are very similar, where they believe that Latino culture also has a big impact on pop culture. AT&T Citizenship and Sustainability Programs that's our way of saying CSR. We take the R out because that's checking the box. It's a value. They yield more than a billion impressions every year. And you might be going, how in the world do you do that? Well, first of all, diversity and inclusion is a value at our company. And it comes from the top. Randall Stevenson is a huge proponent of diversity and inclusion, and you may have seen a certain video that came out last year uh, from an ERG speech, or employee resource group, where he talked about moving from tolerance to understanding. So we have a wonderful foundation that comes from the top, but we also know that there are certain ways to reach these populations, and we are changing the way we're marketing to do it even more because of this browning of America. One way that we do it is that we combine culture and social media. That is how we're winning. 
Why culture? Well, I like to say that culture is the DNA of diversity and is also an invitation to inclusion, inclusiveness. Let's think about that. What is culture? You as Opera America, you should know that music is one of those things. Language is one of those things. Dance is one of those things. Sports is one of those things. Food is one of those things. I could go down the list. How many of these things have you been involved in before, before you even knew you were involved in diversity? It's a gateway to diversity. Culture is a gateway to diversity. And it also is an invitation to come in. So you have an advantage. Being in music, you can invite people in to explore culture and explore diversity. That's how we are approaching our programs in the global marketing organization, especially in corporate communications, where we are driving our programs with insight-driven, culturally nuanced programs that reach all of the segments that we like to reach to, of course, enjoy our services. Why social media? Well, oh, social media is culture soup. How many times have you been involved in a conversation online, whether it's Facebook or Twitter, and you used an emoji or a hashtag that was kind of the hip and happening thing? All throughout this presentation, you've seen a key. That's one emoji that's been used often to stress that something's very important. Culture is key, which is actually one of the hashtags that we use when we're doing these um, presentations. But who in the room knows where the reference to the key came from? I usually get someone, it's DJ Khaled. <laughs> DJ Khaled has a song where he raps and he talks about uh, the keys, he talks about the keys. He has a book where he talks about the keys. How many of you have written something or seen a picture online and then said hashtag work with an E-R-K, not an O-R-K? <laughs> yeah. I had my teams actually research every last one of these little emojis and things that you see on the slide and they track them all back to diverse segments. That, my friends, comes from the LGBT culture. I could go on. In fact, how many of you knew that the word selfie, the root of it, came from a Korean saying? And I'll give you a little background on that. It used to be that the cell phone networks over in Asia were far superior than ours here in the US. So they had phones that would already take pictures. In fact, they had forward-facing cameras before we did. And they would say, cell ka, cell ka. And it was a way to say cell phone camera. But by the time the phones and had progressed and come over to the United States, and we had forward-facing cameras, someone decided to say selfie. There are millions of examples of this online. Social media's culture soup. African Americans over-index on Twitter. You've heard of something called black Twitter. You've also seen hashtags with names attached. That's how the Black Lives Matter movement got started, and it continues. Asian Americans over index on YouTube. Have you ever noticed that if you want to hear a, a really great song, or if you want to, gosh, Gangnam Style? <laughs> K-pop came to us through YouTube, came to the United States. We didn't know where this man came from, <laughs> Sai. <laughs> but suddenly he was the thing. It's because Asian Americans found an outlet on YouTube when Hollywood was shutting them out. Hispanics over index on Facebook and also Instagram. But Facebook first, mainly because it was the first platform that you could translate completely into Spanish and talk to people around the globe. Instagram over indexes with LGBT people. If you <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Snapchat, millennials and Generation Z. I could go on, but social media is culture soup. 
So what we've done is taken culturally nuanced programs and made them social and digital first in order to reach segments and also populations that are diverse. But it didn't just happen overnight that social media became social, um, um, social media became culture soup. It all culminated in 2008 and it probably started in 1991 when the World Wide Web was even in invented and became a thing for consumers. That was the first time that the internet actually came to be. But you had to have broadband, you had to have dial-up or something to access it. You had to have money to have a PC at home. That wasn't the case for everyone. Fast forward to about 2007, and Facebook moves from college and opens to the public. And they introduced their first mobile-enabled app. Also in 2007, Twitter was introduced at South by Southwest. Twitter was the first mobile-enabled social app that people used. But then something else happened in 2007. The iPhone came to the market. But the problem with the iPhone was it's pretty expensive, $700, $800, something like that. Still very expensive. But by 2008, Android came to market. The HTC Sense came to market. And suddenly, open source drives the price down. So you have three things that come together. Internet, social media, on mobile phones. And guess what? Social media on mobile became the great equalizer. Suddenly, an individual had a voice. They could tweet with a certain hashtag, with a certain followership, and you could be on CNN. And haven't we seen it? So we have been leveraging social media in this way, along with cultural insights, to engage in a way that has kept people engaged with our brand and is beginning to endear them to our brand. How can you win with culture? I'm going to give you five keys. Are you ready? Build a culturally inclusive team. Let's stop here for a second. Couple of things. Having one person in the room is not enough. Sometimes you have to have hard conversations. And wouldn't it be great if they knew that there were two or three other people in the room that would get their back? They need to be in the room and at the table, but they also need to be empowered to bring the knowledge to the table. How many of you women in here have been in a room and been mansplained? <laughs> I see hands. Yes, indeed. What if we got information behind each other? Think about it. They need to be empowered to speak, and we also need to be able and open to take ideas into action. It can't just stop in the room. Also, you want to engage in research. I've given you a lot of stats here today. One suggestion that I would have for the opera community if that space is uncomfortable for people of color to come into or feel comfortable, take the opera to them. Figure out how to do that. Also, what you want to do is understand how others have won and failed. We've seen some brands recently take some huge tumbles. But let me tell you, by the time that it makes it to the PR team, the time it makes it to social, it's too late. You need to be thinking about these things in those rooms when you're planning. At AT&T, we're beginning to see where we're um, going to get these conversations going in rooms at the briefing stage. When the agency gets the brief, we want to have these conversations then and all throughout the creative cycle. And then finally, use an authentic voice that is true to your brand. You know, sometimes we get a little, mm, we're going to be diverse and we're going to say something hip. <laughs> and no, <laughs> it doesn't quite work that way. One thing that we do at at and is we allow our influencers to carry the water. And what I mean by that is individuals who have a rapport with those segments or those diverse, um, you know, communities that can speak to them in a way that resonates. So I challenge you to think about what an authentic voice would be for your brand 
And if you want to reach this community, leverage influencers. And really, that's all I have for you today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And I, I quake a little bit at asking you this, but to someone who's outside the world of opera, sure. how does opera look? Well, I'm not that far outside of opera. Okay. Okay. I'm a classically trained mezzo soprano. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we did not know this. <laughs> I don't get to bring that to work very often. No, I guess so not. So I'm very excited to be here and, and look at the intersection of marketing and music. So thank you for having me. That is fabulous. <laughs> so, so from the inside, what does it look like? <laughs> Well, I haven't actually sung opera, but I will say that I've been to one opera um, uh, show, and I, I felt the same way as Carol, is a little uncomfortable. And it wasn't so much what was on the stage. It was more so the surroundings and the, the other people. Um, but, you know, I grew up learning about Kathleen Battle mm -hmm. and Lee and T. Price, yep. and I knew that there was a place for us on the stage. I would love to see more of that. Um, but then again, I, th I think, again, if, if the space is uncomfortable, break out of the space. See if you can take them somewhere else. Take it to the people. And, and use social media, too. Thank you so <laughs> much. So much. Absolutely. Really appreciate uh -huh. it. And um, we're going to do a little change here. Let me help you, Deb. Okay, thanks. Very good. Good. So now we're going to welcome to the stage uh, Roberto Bedoya again and four panelists who are going to respond to what they've heard. Brandon Gry, the Director of Government Affairs from Opera America, Kyanne Harris, Lyric Unlimited Director at the Lyric Opera of Chicago, um, uh, Ann Lee, the Publications and Brand Manager at Opera Theatre of St. Louis, and David Lomelli, the Artistic Art, uh, Assistant Artistic Administrator and Special Projects Manager at the Dallas Opera. Roberto, take it away. Oh, those lights are bright. I don't have to look at them. Uh, you guys do. You guys are, uh, we just, well, first of all, I want to uh, give us, uh, let's give a round of applause to the speakers. They were brilliant. <laughs> they put a lot on the table, uh, some good challenges. You all young bloods. I'm going to be an old man right now. So what did you hear? What, you were listening really, really well. I know you guys are. Uh, but what did you learn from your listening? Oh, I don't even know if there's one thing to pick out of that. There are so many good points that were brought up. But I think um, I love the question that Mark kept asking. Uh, what was your experience? And I think this idea that we as insiders don't recognize how we present ourselves to the community is so important because we keep offering these invitations that people either don't want to take or take once and then never want to come back. So how do we make an invitation and an environment that welcomes people of all backgrounds and create a space, a physical space, and then a social space where people feel not uncomfortable? You guys? Uh, well, to me, this has been the best session at the conference so far. Uh, I just, I can't tell you how much hearing from each of the speakers meant to me and resonated for me um, and also sort of illustrated the challenges that we're facing in this field. Um, I was in a group of people uh, just behind me and, and to my right and left, and there were so many moments where I felt like I, I, there were collective heads nodding and this sense of like, yeah, that's it. Um, and the challenge I think that occurs to me is how do we take that, yeah, that's it, and translate it into the challenging conversations that we need to have in our companies. For, for me, the, the word that just came out of all this, and I'm a little emotional about it, is gratitude. Um, I'm, a, I'm an immigrant, I'm a Mexican citizen. I also have the luck to be, that I sung for quite a while. I was lucky enough to be part of the San Francisco Adler Fellowship where I was taking they had a, a very beautiful waiver that I could sing roles, no matter my nationality, as, as a small or big. Com so I could compete. I wanted to compete with the best, and they gave me that chance. When I transitioned into administration also, I, I had the opportunity to, to land in a, in a 
in a beautiful company where, where the points that, that were made about an inclusive team, you know, we have a wonderful outreach, head of outreach that is Hispanic, and, and also she was our main liaison, the wonderful Shelly Garcia. And our head of education is Kristen Robertson. She has one of the best years in the business too. And three of our top senior staff are women. And we have a foreign music director. And I've been the luck that recently I just got promoted to, to casting manager and manager of the women conductors program. So I think I'm, I mean, I'm very lucky that I landed in a place. And also I'm, grat I'm grateful because with the, with the main political challenge that we have today, where you know there's a possibility that we experience Berlin Wall number two to my people, I found that I'm not alone. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I would say too, we've had so many conversations over the past couple of days about uh, race and casting, which are hugely important conversations. But hearing also the the dialogue that happened from several of the speakers about the comfort level in the audience and people who are from an arts background where you would think that there should be something of a comfort level that conveys uh, to opera is a powerful uh, instruction. As, as Carol had said, that we need to change our culture. We have to look at what is happening that is making individuals feel uncomfortable in their audience and in our organizations and thinking about what our, our structures and processes and habits are on a daily basis and how do those support um, un unintentional racist actions towards others. And if I can jump in with yeah. and maybe cut prematurely to something really blunt, um, I think that we've been having this conversation for a long time. Um, I was lucky enough to attend the 2015 Opera Conference as a student. Um, they were having conversations then. How have we changed? Have we changed? If we're not changing, why do we keep having the conversation not doing anything about it? And today we've had four amazing speakers who have given us action items, like actual things that we can do to make a difference. So my challenge to everyone in the room would be how can we go do those this year, not put it off for another year, not put it off for later, and not act surprised when this continues to be an issue. We have the five keys, we have mm -hmm. Dallas Theater's action plan, we've heard great things, so go use them. And so tell me your action plan. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think for me, one of the big things was listening to Kevin talk about the Rooney Rule and how he has made a commitment to hiring and casting much more diversely. And that's an easy enough thing to do. See one person of color for every spot that you're hiring for, that's not a hard thing to do. There are not a lack of qualified colored people who want to take these jobs. It's about exposure, it's about where you're putting these job listings, bring more people in, and once you have more people in your organization, the conversation about the art, the artists, the composers, the designers, that will start to happen organically as your staff becomes more and more diverse and more engaged with the issue of diversity. I made the joke about you guys all being young bloods, and I was also being very mindful that you are another generation of leadership at this particular table. You're not the directors uh, that we just spoke, that just spoke, who a leadership's charge has been really significant and had significant impact. Well, I'm gonna imagine you all leaders for the moment, and you're sh so I wanna hear what is your belonging strategy that you bring to the opera company that you're running. I'll, I'll dive in. Um, yeah. So I'm the director of Lyric Unlimited. I think most people know Lyric Unlimited is kind of an education community engagement and we also commission and produce opera. So uh, my colleagues like to tease me that we're a, a mini company within the larger company. Um, one of the challenges that, that I find is that um, Lyric Unlimited can be used as the, the place where uh, innovation should happen, or the place where diversity and inclusion should happen. And I think that one of the pitfalls um, that uh, I hope is a cautionary tale would be not to um, ghettoize your community engagement work uh, and use it as a shield against the work that needs to happen throughout the organization. Uh, so one of the things that I've been thinking about, about a lot uh, leading up to this and then also in response to what we've heard is 
um, pondering how to create ownership around the company so that everyone sees their own responsibility uh, no matter where they're working, at, no matter at what level and uh, in, in what area of the company. Um, this is a systematic issue. This is not about programming. This is not about hiring. This is not about any one of those things. And so uh, creating cultural change within an organization really has to involve everyone understanding their role and responsibility in it and considering what the options are, what the action steps are. So how do we create that sense of ownership collectively? And also, how do we keep focused on it? Uh, this is, again, another uh, element for me that I'm challenged by, which is that no one that I work with at, I have incredible colleagues at Lyric, who I, many of whom are here and are cheering and are totally in support, uh, and many of whom are, aren't here, but would absolutely be in support and yet, uh, this can fall in the priorities uh, as we're thinking about money, as we're thinking about the many other um, challenges and, and great things that are happening. So finding a way to sustain focus um, on this issue is what needs to happen. David, you're writing something, yeah. so <laughs> please. Yeah. Well, for my position on, on casting, I think the most effective thing that I can put, uh, you know, to add to the team and the decision-making process is uh, creating standards of, or artistic purpose that we want to put on the stage that, for me, it's, um, we're going to put that at, at, the, at the most, like, like the highest goal. And that means that we also have to tell the story and tell the story correctly and not get in the way with it. You know, like, I, I really get concerned when we talk about, you know, the blackface and the Otello when there's actually guys that can't sing it that are actually our ethnicity that respects the story. Or the same with Madame Butterfly. Like, you just have to actually do a lot of research and you will find it. And, and that sometimes is where I feel that we get comfortable. It's like, you know, my body represents that so so soprano, you just do it. No, like, go find it, make it. It's our, it's our responsibility to tell the story the way that it actually works. And it also uh, creates a different perspective I have to say, in a decision making in the artistic product, the, the fact that I, the, you know, I not, not brag because I, I barely pass the TOEFL, but I speak uh, other languages. Mm -hmm. So when, when we cast something in other, in other things, I was like, well, you know, but if we get a Russian here, she, that, that is the Nico Castell pronunciation. We, that, that is not going to work very much. We have, we have to like, make the effort. And, and, I, and I bring it that to, to the, the, the artists that are, that are come to us. And when we're deciding, it's like, we want the best person, and that includes everything. How do you reflect with the community? How are you gonna sing the part? How are you gonna look the part? How are you gonna act the part? And that's the responsibility. If we get dirty, we, we do the, the, the handwork to pick that person, you know, we actually could connect with audience better, with fundraising better, with our board better, because we succeed at that telling the story. I, from, from thinking about it from a government affairs perspective, you know, one of the things I pride myself on is being able to talk about policy and legislation in a nonpartisan, neutral tone. And yet, <laughs> 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 like, like David said, there is a constant flow of emotion that is, that is running all the time. And this is the first time, I think, in my life, not in my life, this is the first time that I have personally felt threatened by lawmaking. And w there are so many issues out there that are uh, consistently looked at as specifically arts issues, and yet when I walk into work, I don't leave behind the personal threats, the personal sense of unsafety that I feel outside of work. It comes with me. So in the future, when I'm leaving, recognizing that success that we've had of diversifying our staff, of diversifying our artists, of diversifying our audiences, they are all bringing in different senses of, different burdens, different senses of, uh, la of a lack of safety, those other challenges. So when things are happening and some, uh, an unarmed black man is killed by police, that is not a non-opera issue. When Muslim immigrants are being threatened and, and told that they can't come into the country. That is not a non-opera non issue. It is something that we have to think about because that is impacting 
the people who are working with us and coming to our art form. There is a, um, in the field of sort of engagement process and the language of being, making safe spaces, can you talk a little bit about the field of opera that you're working in and you're working, how do you make an engaged space as opposed to, which is different than a safe space? I'm going back to Carol's comment about like walking into the opera house and feeling weird. So that was me too. I mean, you know, it wasn't, if Mark didn't give me the homework assignment, I wouldn't have done it. Uh, <laughs> and I loved it. I loved it. You know, but, you know, I had, he was a great um, host. And I felt like a welcome guest in a house that was very foreign to me. Uh, so, but let's spin a little bit before we have to close out this notion of engagement around these very difficult subject areas, these, these sort of, uh, and, and Brandon, because you know that policy is sort of like one of my little, cultural policy is very weird because culture is very fluid and policy aims to fix. Mm -hmm. You know, so you've got these two energies kind of rubbing up against these things. And this is one of the interesting challenges of leadership. So talk a little bit about engagement. Trying to, I'm trying to think of how to express myself. I mean, you don't have uh, to do anything. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I think I just go back to what I said, like just having an awareness of what is happening. Like we can't, you know, talking, like let's, let's for example, uh, think about work that's happening within an opera house, ig ignoring things that are happening outside of that space. Different issues are now banging at our door. Different issues that people are facing are, 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 are breaking through the, the doors of the opera house. And, and we have to be aware and sensitive. And it's not just about being welcoming, but it, we, have to, we have to, and I think I'm just repeating what I said earlier, we have to, that part of the welcoming and engagement is when we're doing our work, we just, we have to know some of the challenges that other, other individuals who are not part of our immediate community are facing. Whether it's LGBT issues, whether it's issues faced by um, blacks and African Americans, by women, how do we how do we have an awareness of that so that it, it and sensitivity so that it impacts all of our decision making and it impacts everything that we're doing on a daily basis that is part of the habit of our work. Uh, I I was uh, remembering something that Zanetta shared that really resonated with me, which was um, what does welcome really mean. And uh, I think that's something that I personally want to, and I encourage everyone to pause and think about um, both the idea that partnerships are often formed um, in a way that the, the larger um, traditional institution is the primary beneficiary, and it's a way to connect to another cultural community, but there's a real inequity in how that is set up and that partnership may dissolve once that particular program concludes. Um, the image proposition, the, um, the ways that with good intentions, we may be feeling as though we are welcoming other communities into our opera houses, um, when in fact we're reinforcing that that relationship uh, has a limit. Um, I think that was a real, um, the, the way that you described it was so crystal clear, and I think that's something um, that I want to consider further. Um, what does welcome really mean? And, you know, a, another point that was made around uh, Nelson Mandela and, and uh, getting to know the kitchen staff, and, and um, I think often there's a story being told in our opera houses whether we realize it or not. Sometimes it's that uh, the security guards and the ushers may be the only people of color. Um, and uh, everybody else that you see is there as a patron uh, is, uh, is not a person of color, or very few. Um, I will also say, having come from working in the orchestral world, uh, when I first came to opera, I thought, oh my god, there's a wealth of diversity here. <laughs> 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 so, um, I, I, I'm, it, it's, I guess it's all relative, right? Because <laughs> Uh, I, I actually often do see very diverse audiences at Lyric and, and on stage. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, there's, there's degrees. Um, but I think um, thinking about the story we're telling 
as anyone is entering the house. You know, who is, uh, who is on your pre-concert announcement? Who is telling people to turn their cell phones off? If every entity uh, that people encounter is somebody who is Caucasian, every leadership, uh, you know, we're telling a story, and that may not be the story we're intending to tell. Uh, just, you know, uh, to finish a little bit, for, for me also, I think that we have to come back to basic human, humani basic humanity, you know, the way, and we have to do it as, as individuals in the upper house and as an institution, you know, how many of us say hi to the cleaning crew? That also, and it has to be an everyday effort, and also the same thing when we do a partnership to, to, to attract a community, you know, it's not enough just do a Hispanic opera that was written by, by Anglo-Saxons, like, you know, let, let's do it. If we're going to do it, let's do it right. And, uh, and then follow up, you know, let, let, at the end of the day, you know, lessons that I have seen with Hamilton, when he gave the voice to the ones that, that they wanted to say, or in soccer where they, you know, the best player is the one that plays, you know, doesn't matter the color, no, it doesn't matter where they come. If you play, if you're Messi, you're Cristiano Ronaldo, you, you grow on. Uh, it's like, let them compete. The product, the artistic product is gonna get better if you let them compete. Please. Um, I have so many thoughts going through my head right now. I think the, the question of authenticity and following up after an invitation is so important as well. Um, people, the Asian community doesn't want to be reached out to because you're doing Turin Dot. They just don't. Like, and they might come, <laughs> but <laughs> just think about what comes next. And I think we've been asked to not get too far into the cultural producing, culturally sensitive producing topic because that's another session you should all come to tomorrow. But um, just one word about that, though, I think it relates to the experience that people have when they walk in. People of any minority or multicultural people don't want to walk in to see just stories about how valiantly their people have suffered. <laughs> that yes. lost his cachet a long time ago. <laughs> so, Thank you. if you're programming new work, um, I was struck by a comment that, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name, but that a composer made in the Women's Opera Network session earlier this afternoon about how she doesn't want to be considered an urban, uh, an urban artist because she's African American. She doesn't have urban stories to tell. She has stories to tell. So when you invite in communities, invite them to stories, not culturally specific stories, invite them to stories that they want to see because they are people, because they have a variety of experiences, and take those varieties into consideration when you make the invitation. And also, the one, I think, challenge that I would also toss out, and I'm bouncing it around a little bit, but just imagine yourself walking through a space where you are not the majority face that you see. Um, I was very fortunate this past spring to be able to go to the new uh, National Ameri African American History Museum in DC. And it is an amazing experience, not only because the museum is well designed and incredibly thoughtfully curated, it is incredible because you see people who are white or Caucasian, who walk through and realize for the first time maybe in their life that they are not the majority color in the room. And people very quickly change their attitudes towards what they're seeing, how they're interacting with people around them, because they've never had that experience before. So even if it's only in your own community, go to a neighborhood where you might be the only white person on the street, or the only person of your color on the street. And just, I think that type of visceral experience will feed so well into thinking about how customers of all backgrounds experience your organization. Very good. Mark, where'd you go? <laughs> I just want to be respectful of the agenda uh, and so to wrap up, thank you so much. Thank you, speaker. Mark, parting shots. Thank you thank everyone here. Uh, Kayan, An, David, Brandon, we take your comments as a charge uh, not as just observations, but as commands. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention and for our special guests. Thank you.